how great that is, Lord. How great it is that no matter in this world that's so crazy and so upside down and so shaking right now, Lord God, we have a firm foundation in you and in Christ. And we know who we are and we know who you are, Lord. We know who you, we are in you. And Lord, we have peace and we have grace and we have triumphant joy. So Lord, thank you. I ask you to cause your word to teach us this day things that we will learn from this Resurrection Sunday. And uh, put it deep in our hearts, Lord God, and let it be seen in our lives. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a Christian, one of our greatest joys and responsibilities is to explain the Scriptures to someone who is searching. In these frustrating and confusing final days of grace, There are so many people that think they have no use for the Bible that when you do see someone who is intent to learn, it is a great joy and satisfaction to help them. I love to teach the Word of God. I think you all know that. I love to teach the Word of God and to watch people's reaction when they finally say, now I get it, the light goes on, the door of understanding opens. Things that didn't make sense begin to make sense. I know that joy when the Holy Spirit opens a scripture for me and I gain revelation knowledge. And when we bring illumination to others, it blesses both the giver and the receiver. There's no greater example of this than the scriptures we're going to read this morning. In the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus confronts two of his followers who are walking in sadness and doubt and fear and confusion, Let me say that again, who are walking in doubt and fear, worry, confusion. Anybody that's in that state, listen up today. They can't make out any sense of what what they don't understand. And Jesus shatters their confusion with the light of truth. We have all had people open the scriptures to us. And they are people we never forget. For me, one such example is Terry Virgo. I heard Terry preach on the doctrine of grace, a teaching that took three days as he meticulously laid it out, and it became a great and strong part of my foundation. And whether you realize it or not, it's now part of your foundation. Because that's another thing, and the benefit of explaining the scriptures, the student becomes the teacher themselves as light is transferred to a receptive mind. We're going to see all of that today in today's story. So let's read it first, and then we'll break it down. And behold, two of the disciples were traveling the same day, resurrection morning, Easter morning, were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus drew himself uh, near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another, pardon me, as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have not known the things that are happening in these days? And Jesus answered, what things? And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all these things, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not, him they did not see. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, 
for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Let's tear it apart a little bit. Starts here. Now behold, two of his disciples were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. That seven miles is somewhat important. And they talked together of all the things that had happened. Two of Jesus' disciples are on their way home to the town of Emmaus. We don't even know exactly where Emmaus was. There's no sign of it left. But we're told it was about a seven-mile trip. Jesus will describe both of these men as sad. This story takes place on Sunday afternoon. It has been three days since the crucifixion of Jesus. They are on their way home. And why not? Passover was over. Jesus was over. Everything was over. Their hurts, their hopes rather, and expectations have been crushed. It's all over before it even began. Jesus is dead. He didn't have a chance to even begin his triumphant reign. It was over before it began. As Jesus' disciples, we don't know how long these two had known him or been around him, but it was long enough that they could attach their hopes and dreams to him, and they certainly weren't ignorant of the events that had happened that week. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus drew near and went with them. We are told that these two were doing much more than talking they were reasoning things. This is where I think so much of you and I come in. This is a strong Greek word. It means they're trying to get to the bottom of things, trying to find the sense in it all. It is no different when anyone's life is cut short. My son-in-law, our previous son-in-law, former son-in-law, I should say, some years ago committed suicide on the 1st of January. And I watched a family go through all kinds of gymnastics for one reason. They were trying to make sense of it. And you got to understand, this is what these are. Jesus is a young man. He's 33 years old, and he is dead. And they don't understand it. And like all of us, they're trying to find sense in what makes no sense. Somehow thinking, haven't we all been there, that if we could just understand, if we could just, if God would just tell us why, maybe then we could come to grips with it. Maybe then it would begin to make sense to us. We want things to make sense, but there are times in this life when certain things just don't make sense and you're not going to know. But there is that desire to know, that desire to think that if we would just know, maybe we would find some peace. But I guarantee you, you're not going to find peace because it still wouldn't make sense. So that's where these two men are at. They've tried to figure it all out. And it's in the middle of this conversation that Jesus suddenly draws near to them. You see, the problem is, thinking about this right now, you know, you've been studying with me this progress of the disciples' training. Of course, with Easter, we're ahead of schedule a little bit on this. But you have seen the, the, uh, the, the whole fact that uh, they were trying to reason Jesus out. They were trying to reason how he could be the Son of God. They tried to reason how he could be the Messiah. They were trying to reason with themselves how he could die. And so we've seen all this reasoning happening. So these two disciples aren't the only one. They're just the ones that we're, we're reading about. But I'm sure the whole group right now is trying to make sense of things. Jesus comes up to them at that point, And he suddenly draws near to them. And it wasn't unusual for strangers to join together as they traveled. Getting to know someone would help the miles to pass. It was a walking society. They had seven miles to go to Emmaus, which was about two hours. And also in traveling in groups, there was safety from robbers. So we are told that Jesus, let's go on to the next one here. 
but their eyes were restrained so they did not know him. This is what Jesus was doing. He was specifically restraining their eyes because if they knew him, he was not going to be able to teach them what he wanted to teach them. So he restrains their eyes, which also tells us, again, we don't know the status of these two disciples. Other than Cleopas, we're not given the other guy's name. We don't hear about them anyplace else in Scripture but this story. And uh, we don't know how much they had walked with Jesus. We're not really sure how much they, they knew. But we know one thing. If they had seen him, they would have known him. They were that familiar with him that if he hadn't restrained their eyes, just walking up on them, they would have known that he was the Messiah. We are told that Jesus restrained their eyes from knowing him, so obviously they would have known him by sight. But he chooses to conceal himself so that he may accomplish what he's doing. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you're having one another as you walk and are sad? They're discussing this on the seven-mile walk back to Emmaus. Jesus was the world's greatest teacher. And we have enough teachers in this congregation to know <coughs> that good teachers ask good questions, don't they? Good teachers ask good questions because they want to stimulate the thought process and forces the student to examine their position. And that's what Jesus is doing. And these two are shocked by his question. Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened in these days? Today we would say, Man, are you kidding me? If you don't know, you're the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know. And as much as the scribes and the chief priests wanted to keep this quiet, they didn't want this to be public. They wanted to do this in the dark. They wanted to do this in secret. But now Jerusalem with the Passover has swelled to 2 million people. That was the average, day, uh, average population during the festival of the Passover. And so you got 2 million people. Everybody knows. In other words, there's 2 million people that know what happened in this last week, and you're the only one that doesn't know. They're flabbergasted by it. He said that you don't know the things that had happened. But then they said, he says to them, well, what things? He just compounds it. But he's wanting to know where they're coming from. He wants to know their position. He wants to know how much they know because he's about to give them a great lesson. We go on then. And they said to him, when he said, what things? He said, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. The first thing that that reveals about their extents of their nature, of what they know is who Jesus is. We could say that the answer to any problem is first determined by who Jesus is. Think about that. Every problem that you're going to run into in life is going to be answered first off by who is Jesus. I don't care if it's the car won't start. The answer is who is Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? It's important because you've got to know who Jesus is to you so that you'll know who you are in him. And so there may come times when you doubt or worry or wonder as things are going, and you're in that reasoning stage like those disciples, and you're trying to reason out things that don't make sense. And, it's, and you have to think about who Jesus is. You know, if, if Jesus, see, I mean, in knowing who Jesus is is where you find your peace and where you find your grace. Here you have a, a young lady that has a... Uh, a diagnosis that we don't want to hear. Here we have grandma that is, you know, battling some things right now, big time, and so on. And we try to make sense of things. You know, we try, we try to make sense of it. But the truth of it is, the whole thing is going to begin with who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? If Jesus is the guarantor of all the promises of God and all the promises are yes and amen in him, that's a good starting point. To understand who Jesus is and understand who you are in Jesus. And he is, he is your Savior. He is your Lord. He is your Master. He is the one that is in control of your life. He is the Good Shepherd. He is the Faithful One. He is the Yes and the Amen. See, so often we don't come to that until we've gotten rid of all the other possibilities. Then maybe we'll sit down and think about who Jesus is. 
when it should be the very first thing we think about in any situation of life. Who is Jesus and who am I in him? These two were his disciples, but they must have been missing the day that Peter declared that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. These two didn't score any higher than the general public. Remember when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? The disciples were from that area of Galilee. They knew the people. They knew the conversations. He says, who do people say that I am? And what was the answer? They say, you are a prophet. These men have not progressed much beyond them. A prophet who did great deeds with authority before the eyes of people and before the eyes of God. But then they tell him what has him confused. This is what's confusing him. How the chief priests and our rulers... If it was the Romans, they could have understood it. They wouldn't have liked it, but they wouldn't be saying, let's try to make sense of this. What didn't make sense is that it wasn't the Romans that they blamed for the crucifixion of their hero, Jesus. They blamed, right where it belonged, the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. So the whole population knew this was not, the Romans were just the means by which it was carried out. But this was done by the authorities in Jerusalem. They wanted to believe that Jesus was the Messiah King who would cast off the Roman tyranny. And if Jesus was going to be killed, we can understand if it was the Roman authorities crucifying him. But it wasn't the Romans. It was our own leaders. It was our own chief priests that delivered him up to death. The whole thing just doesn't make sense. As much as we try to reason these events out, it just doesn't make sense. And then they re 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 come to the source of their sadness. We were hoping that he was going to be the one that would come and redeem Israel. This was their expectation. The works he did, the acceptance by the multitudes, everyone thought that he was the one, the one that everyone was so waiting for. What could possibly have gone wrong? Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. He said he would rise on the third day. They were aware of that. And here we are. It's the third day. It's late in the afternoon. We don't see him. They weren't waiting anymore. He said the third day. We're almost at the end of the third day. We're going home. It's over. There's no hope. We don't understand it. In our lifetimes, there's been others that claim to be the Messiah, but this guy was the closest. This guy was doing it all. This guy was doing things that nobody else did. The people loved him. Wrong reason, but they loved him. They didn't realize that, but they loved him. How could this have all gone so wrong? They knew that he said he would rise on the third day, and there was some supporting evidence of his resurrection but they just couldn't make that leap of faith. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they also had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of, these, a certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. The words of the women were verified by what Peter and John saw at the tomb. But they just weren't going to trust what couldn't be verified. The teacher had asked the question. He knows the extent of those, uh, the extent of their faith, and he immediately zeroes in on the problem. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. This is what should hit us today. Because every one of us tends to go, fall into that category of trying to make everything make sense. And before we, and, and it's not like, well, the things that make sense are okay. The Bible says in all these things, in everything, why are we so slow to believe? You know, and when you read this, when Jesus himself says, oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have spoken, we begin to see Jesus' determination that we should understand the word and believe the word of God. And if Jesus wants us to believe the word of God, no longer he, no wonder he went to the extent that he did 
to choose these 12 men that we talked about, of course, excluding Judas, but these 12 men who would faithfully record all of these things because he wants us to be. I mean, well, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, the very first thing we should say is what says the Scriptures? And we live in a world today where nobody knows what the Scriptures say. Nobody goes running to the Scriptures. Everybody's running away from Scripture. The Scriptures are an inconvenient truth in our day. And Jesus says, you are foolish. You're spending all this time trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense to you when you should immediately go to the Scriptures and understand what the Scriptures say, what the prophets have said. These men didn't understand the Scriptures, so there was no place in their theology for the death of the Messiah which meant there was no place in their theology for his resurrection. This wasn't because they rejected the scriptures. It wasn't that they hadn't read the scriptures. It wasn't that they didn't believe the scriptures. It was just that they were not in complete understanding of the scriptures. Jesus rebukes them for their partial belief, not believing all. All that the prophets said. Partial truth is always dangerous. You can't pick and choose what to believe and in their, in their beliefs, these two disciples were right in line with the rest of, of Jesus' disciples. Jesus tells them that, they should, that they, what they should have understood. He goes, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? Now, I want to play teacher for just a moment. I want to make you think. I want to ask you something to get your thought processes going. Jesus says that he is the Messiah had to suffer. My question to you is, why? Let me say it again. Don't answer me, but think about this. Jesus said he as the Messiah had to suffer. He didn't say die. He knew he was going to die. That was part of it. But he says that he had to suffer. My question to you is why? Why wasn't the cross enough? Why the beatings, the scourgings, the slapping, the spitting, the beard pulling? We're told that patience is a product of suffering but it doesn't answer why. I believe I have an answer that I can share with you. I just want you to think. Maybe you've never thought about that. We talk about the cross, the cross, the cross. The cross is everything. The cross is that. The cross is the place of suffering. The word crucifixion itself comes from the deep words of agony of the cross. So why did all this other stuff had to happen? Why why all this stuff added to it? Why all this suffering? I'll tell you what I believe. But before we can answer this, we have to ask another question. Number one, why must the, why must the Messiah suffer? And number two, why isn't the logistical properties of hell enough? The flames, the thirst, the darkness... Why isn't that enough? Why are we told that hell is a place of eternal torture, of inflicted torture? In this parable, Jesus talks about the man who is turned over to hell and says he's turned over to the torturers. Why are there torturers in hell when the very logistics of hell are torture in itself? I believe the answer to this can only be that this is a lesson on, for us on God, how, how God sees sin. We live in a world today where nobody wants to take sin seriously anymore. And I think looking through the eyes of God, we come up with an answer. Something that struck me, something that I experienced several months ago, and I wanted to share it with you. In the mid-1800s, there was a serious revolt in Ireland against the British crown. Several of the leaders of that rebellion were captured and sentenced to death. One day, as Queen Victoria was walking the halls of Buckingham Palace, she had a servant that was crying. 
The servant excused herself and would have left, but she stopped her and she said, why are you crying? She said, my nephew is in that bunch that are condemned. And she said, ma'am, I know he deserves to die, but he doesn't deserve to die like that. She said, like what? She said, he will be drawn or he will be hung. Not to death. They just hang him until they can't breathe and it becomes a terrible ordeal. He will be hung. Then after he's hung, he'll be stretched on a rack. And every fiber and muscle in his body will be separated. Every joint will be taken out of joint. And then when that's done, while he's still alive, they will pull out his entrails in front of his eyes. And then they will cut off his head. And then they will quarter his body. And it will be sent to different places in the kingdom. Victoria was taken aback. She didn't realize that this was the punishment assigned to these men, and it had been since the Middle Ages. She immediately called for her prime minister, Lord Melbourne, to come to Buckingham Palace. And she listed the punishments of these men and asked him, is this true? He said, yes. She said, I want these men sent to the penal colonies in Australia as their punishment. His answer was, but your majesty, they have committed treason. From the moment of creation, let's go back. From the moment of creation, all sin was viewed as a capital offense. Any sin that says that my rights have a higher place than the rights of God, sin is cosmic treason. Sin is cosmic treason. Do you understand that Jesus didn't take a beating because he deserved a beating? He had done nothing wrong. He was crucified not because of anything he did, but because of us. See, we will, we will sit there and we will say we understand, and we do to some extent. We understand the cross. We understand that Jesus takes our sin, our sin nature, on that cross. But one thing we don't talk about is the beating that he took. And do we not realize that that was our beating? This, this is what God was showing us as what he thinks of sin. All sin is cosmic treason. As Victoria wanted to do something a little milder, something, something less horrific. And Melbourne had to say, but madam, this is treason. Treason is different. And the beating he took was for our treason against him. Jesus has to suffer because he took my treason, so taking my punishment. Jesus had to suffer for my high treason. He laid on Jesus the iniquity of all. What this tells us is just how serious. Anybody's playing with sin, you better think about it. Because this is how God sees it. Now the school of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is in session. And once again, Jesus' classroom is on the walking trails of Israel. Ought not to Christ, that's what he asked him. From the moment, I want to go past that. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. Boy, wouldn't we have loved to have been in that school? They've got, and you, you would think, well, that's a massive undertaking. They've only got at best two hours. Wouldn't you love to have heard that two-hour teaching? Jesus explaining, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, going through the Bible, going through the Old Testament. Not only does he tell them all the scriptures, it says he expounds in it. Jesus is teaching Jesus. Man, that's the class anybody would want to be in. It's hard for us as Gentiles, it's hard for me as a Gentile preacher to understand all the things of the Old Testament. I would love to have been in there. I know certain things that he could have pointed to, but I'm sure he went through the whole Old Testament and he did it in such a way that he could expound on and still be done in two hours and all these things concerning himself. Jesus had told the Jewish leaders, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. I wish there was such a thing as a King, James, or King Jesus study Bible. Would have been nice to have known what he said. Someone has said this. I thought it was cute. Oh, missed one. Ah, did I forget to put that on there? I guess I did. 
No, no, I, I did. The Bible is a hymn book. H-I-M. I lost my cute thing there. The Bible is a hymn book. It's all about him. And then I just want to give you this. I had never seen this before. The Bible in a nutshell. The Old Testament says he's coming. The gospel says he's here. The book of Acts proclaiming. The epistles explain him. And Revelation says he is coming again. That is the Bible in a nutshell. So he explains all this to them. He says, when they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is towards evening and the day is far spent. I didn't think about this until I was writing this. I wonder if that is the origin of that great hymn, Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. Makes sense. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? He would have gone on. He, he may have acted like it, but I think he would have gone on if they hadn't invited him to come in because God never forces his presence on anyone. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open that door, if anyone will allow me in, my father and I will dine with them and they with us. And so here this is lived out. Was this Mideastern hospitality or just that they couldn't get enough? They didn't want him to leave because their sadness was now joy. What they tried to make sense of on their own, he has made clear, and the light is now on. It goes on to say, Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed, and broke it. Don't think of this as a communion. This isn't a communion, okay? What's, you know what's odd here? What Jesus is doing, the host is supposed to have done. But I think these two men are so engrossed in this conversation. They have. Do you realize that right now on planet Earth, these are the two greatest theologians in the world? They know what nobody else knows. Jesus has taught them personally from the scriptures all about him. And they're the only ones that know it. And I can imagine that they're, they're just talking and talking. You know, they're... There's such a joy to the Word of God. There's just a joy to being around God's people, exploring these things and so on. I still remember that church in Columbia, Christian Fellowship, which we kind of sprang from the concept of what they had and how they had uh, a big room like this that was off the main sanctuary and there were the fake trees in the room and they all had these, these small white lights all around the room. It was a very subtle lighting, you know, and they had an ice cream machine that they put in there, and these, most of them being college kids in Columbia that were attending the school there, when the service was over at 8 o'clock or whatever that evening, they wouldn't go home. They wanted to sit and talk about the things of God, and they put a fireplace in there, and, and people had, they had couches, and, and it was a very comfortable setting, and they said it was, they didn't even lock the doors, they said you'd come in at 2 in the morning and people would still be there because they wanted to discuss the Word of God. Wow. This is what they wanted. And I think you can see it with these men. These men have gone from absolute devastation. We thought he was the one. We put all our hopes and all our dreams in him. He said he'd rise the third day. It's late in the day. We haven't seen him. Jesus is dead. The movement is dead. Our hopes are dead. Maybe they were older men and thought they'll never see it again in their lives. This was their one chance to anchor their hopes in this young man that came out of Galilee for them. And so I think they're so engrossed in this. And I hope you know what this is talking about. I hope you have had that time where the Bible just opens up, whether it's something on your own reading or something somebody has showed you. But there's nothing better than when you can look at something and say, now I get it. For me, that was the chapter in Romans in which Paul talked about how, you know, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, and he went on through this, and I've chosen this, and I've chosen that, and I've chosen this, and I've chosen that. And you work through all of, of all the hard language that Paul has and you study that and you study that and you go, oh my gosh, what's he really trying to say here? This really doesn't make sense. And then the door opens, the light goes on and you realize that God is not choosing people. He is choosing the plan of salvation which will be by faith in his son. And that's all it's saying. But you have to read through all this morass of things. It's almost as if God wanted to hide that 
that jewel there for those who would really seriously search it out. I hope you've all had that experience of having a scripture just open up to you and you can understand these men. I mean, the, what has gone from absolute sadness is now absolute joy. They haven't seen him yet. They didn't have to see him. He just made it all make sense. If my former son-in-law's parents, if somebody could sit down with them and say, this is what really happened, this is what you don't know, and, and maybe make sense to the whole thing. Sometimes that's an answer in itself, just to make sense of the issue. And so here we see Jesus acting as the host. He's the one taking the bread. He's the one blessing it, and he broke it. Again, this isn't a communion thing. But it says, then their eyes were opened. And uh, they may have been through the, the communion, if you will, in the upper room, but they may not have. Some suggest this, that when he lifted up the bread to pray over it, that they saw the marks. However it was, at this point, Jesus reveals who he is, and he vanishes from them. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? We can understand that. But when, when God shows you things, it's just so neat. It's so wonderful. It's so neat in ministry. You know, I think back about when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. Remember, before that, it says they were all hungry, you know, and he sent the disciples on into town to get some food for him, and knowing that he needed this alone time with this woman at the well. And he, he speaks to the woman at the well, and you know the story, and then the disciples come back, and they said, we've brought you food, and he says, I'm not hungry. Basically, they're saying, well, why aren't you hungry? He said, because I, I have food that you don't know about. And he said that food was to do the will of his father. I know myself, I have seen times where I haven't felt the best or whatever. And you get up and get into the word and you start preaching the word and it all changes. You don't feel the things that you were feeling. Getting into the word, getting into prayer. You guys know what I'm talking about. You can go into your own Bible study. You can go into your own worship in one of the worst moods going and it will change you. You never come out as you entered in. It's a life-changing book. Life-changing relationship. When the scriptures are opened up to us, there is joy for the student, but there's also joy for the teacher. It does burn inside. In fact, once that happens, and you know what the next step of that is? When you've learned something really neat from the Word of God, you want to go tell somebody. So they arose that very hour. You've got to remember, this is nighttime. It's dangerous to be walking on those paths at night. So they arose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the end of the story. And this also is... We haven't got there yet, but in the understanding of the disciples, how they, could, they, they kept misunderstanding Jesus, know he's the Son of God, still had doubts about who he was, what he was going to do, how it didn't all make sense. Because really the two disciples were in themselves a microcosm of the bigger group. They were all in the same boat. But now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you when I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. The whole Old Testament. Now here's their turn. And he opened their understanding. Notice he does this without teaching them the whole Old Testament. It doesn't say in starting at Moses he repeated what these two men on the road to him may have said. No, in just a moment of time he completely opens their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Notice now he doesn't say, Don't tell anybody. Remember how often we've gone through that. He'd heal somebody, he'd do something, and he'd say, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. But that's because it was an incomplete gospel, but the gospel is now complete. Now they understand. Now they know he had to suffer. Now they know he had to die. Now they know he, he rises again, and he is the Christ. 
And so they know all that. And so now he says, because you know all this, go tell everybody. No more restraints, no more restrictions. Go out and tell everybody what is going on. It's a beautiful story that Jesus would once again conceal his glory. He's in his glorified body. He just walks up in these men with a conversation and he puts their heart at ease. He causes them to understand the scriptures. That's why we never go and study the scriptures without praying. We need the Holy Spirit to open our understanding to the word of God. Not something we're going to do on our own. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you. I don't know which lesson out of this to point to first, Lord God. The fact that we spend so much time reasoning things rather than believing your word. When right from the beginning we should just trust your word, Lord God. Even if we don't understand that. But that's where our trust is, is in your word. And Lord, your word is the answer in itself. We know what your word says about things, and that has to be our position on things, unless you change something. And so, Lord, we'll stand on your word. Lord, we won't pick and choose. We'll believe it all. And we'll believe it for your glory. So, Lord, we do ask you to open our understanding, our comprehension. Father, I pray that you'll reach ahead into tonight. As I always pray before, hopefully everybody prays. And I want to, while everybody's head is bowed, I want to compliment everybody. Because I see every Sunday now more and more people coming down and praying at these altars. I love it. God loves it. It's fantastic. And Lord, we should pray before we do anything with you. And invite you to be the God of everything that we do. So Lord, we pray that you will go ahead tonight with your gracious spirit and prepare the hearts of these men to understand that they, for all the heinousness of perhaps what they have done, that we're all in the same boat. We all fall short of God's glory. We all need grace. And you make that available. So Lord, we pray that maybe what doesn't make sense to us and to them will make sense as we look at your holy word. So, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that we are so identified in your Son. Lord Jesus, we died with you, we rose with you, we reign with you, we sit at the right hand of the Father in you. Lord, you know what? That doesn't make sense either, but we don't have to understand it. We accept it by faith because that's what your word says. Thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your obedience unto death. Father, thank you for the special gift of your son holy spirit thank you for being the one who makes it all real to us and we just want to tell you how much we love you appreciate you and are thankful for you in jesus name amen have a great easter resurrection day